move from the practical to the very controversial uh, global warming. Uh, can you give us a very brief thinking person's guide to the global warming controversy? <laughs> Maybe that falls to me. Um, That uh, well, if I could do that, I, I, I uh, maybe I should be be paid. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> be, 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 yeah, exactly. Be, be paid so much more and have such a very yeah. special place in society. Um, so I don't want to assume that I can do something that so many people have failed at, but I will give it a sad little shot here. The um, I think the. The idea that there's scientific consensus and that's it is a counterproductive idea. And if I could erase one, um, one thread from this discussion, it would be the idea that, well, we have scientific consensus, therefore it's over, let's, let's go home, and, and you are not a part of this conversation. I don't think that's helpful. And uh, even for people who grossly disagree with my reading of the data, I would much rather have that voice at the table than, than just say, well, a particular voice has to be silenced here because we had a vote and you're out. The reality is even if we have a vote and we're right, we're gonna miss things and we need to have those critical voices. So I think that's a healthy part of the dialogue and it's unfortunate that we've moved to a place where we, uh, in some sense, we're trying to section off the dialogue. So that's the first part of it. Um, this, the second portion of it is, I have, a, I have a big question here, and I don't really have an answer to this, but my, ba my big question is, why do people, and I include myself in this, why do we, when we come to a problem like this, which is very complicated, very nuanced, very challenging, um, why do we make a gut reaction type decision in a particular direction? Because we do. Um, I have students who come to me and they clearly have a formed idea at 18, 19, 20. I did at 18, 19, 20, 30, 32, 34. Um, where do these ideas come from? Because oftentimes what's very clear with the student and then becomes clear with myself as well on reflection is that they have this idea on and they have it based on very very little information very very little knowledge very 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 little time put in thinking about it so this is a very complicated issue in order to really come to a meaningful answer we need to spend a lot of time with it and a lot of uncomfortable time with it and recognize where our biases are so by spending a lot of time with it I think also what we want to do aside of just instead of just looking at this issue and trying to sort this out, true, false, we also want to look at what the, impl the implications are, where this might lead us. And I think at some level, if we can focus on what the implications are, then we in some ways might be able to sidestep some of the controversies. So we say, let's assume that global warming is true. What are the implications and what would be a responsible course of action? Let's assume global warming is false. What are the good arguments against that? What are the implications? What would we do? What would we respond? There's overlap there. Because global warming false, we still are consuming a lot of fossil fuels. Those go into the atmosphere, not just carbon dioxide, but particulates, polynuclear aromatic hydrocarbons, if we want to get technical, all these things that cause cancer, that cause death, independent of a warming atmosphere or not, there is an environmental cost to how we live our lives. 30 plus thousand people die every year in this country from automobile accidents. There is a real cost for how we live our lives. We don't think about those things. We don't reflect on those things. We're very concerned about what's happening in Japan with the nuclear crisis there, but we're not aware of the fact that the automobile <laughs> crisis here every year from driving around is probably going to be 10x or something like that. What's going to come out from what happened in Japan? And that's, that, by the way, is going to take place over the next decades, right? So I, I think the thinking man's part of this, the, to get back to the question, the thinking man's answer is um, sit with the problem seriously and sit with the implications of, of the problem 
in both the it's true case and the it's false case and look for overlap there and then maybe actually do something about it. I'm afraid that we are stuck in a place where we just dialogue and we don't actually change anything and I think Al Gore gets a bad rap but a classic example of this is he's winning a Nobel Prize, he has this film, all of this stuff and then somebody does the energy audit on his house, right? And it's, it's, it's a gross com, uh, consumption that he's engaged in in the middle of all of this and I feel like that's generally true for all of us. We can have these conversations, but if we never move it beyond the conversation into how we actually live, then I feel like all we're doing is heaping up guilt on ourselves through these conversations. So understanding the implications and then trying to actually move on that in a sensitive way, I think, is really where we want to push things. Can I yeah. say something about the implications here in environmental ethics, in fact, in applied ethics in general, there's a principle called the precautionary principle which says something to the effect that in the absence of scientific consensus, if the potential consequences are very serious, you ought to, as a precaution, err on the side of not doing it than doing it, even if in the absence of a consensus that it's going to cause these effects. One thing we know for sure, if global warming continues at the rate that uh, many of the climatologists say it will, if that happens, the burden is going to fall on the poorest of the poor. We could all afford to pay more for our gas, for our water, for our food. What about the poorest of the poor? Shouldn't we be concerned for them? Part of our stewardship ought to be thinking about those sorts of implications. You know, I, I'd like to ask a question of you and see if I'm on the right track here. I, I've heard both of you lecture, all three of you actually, lecture on issues related to global warming. And, uh, and I've had a, a number of my friends ask me and family members ask me, what do I think about it and how do I characterize this issue? Uh, uh, let me ch share with you how I've been saying this and, and have you tell me if I'm on the right track here. I, I kind of look at it in this way. I think that, um, that the, while there's controversy in, among the scientists about whether mankind is really having an impact on our climate in a big way. Um, I think there's a lot less controversy and, and maybe more certainty, I, I might be that bold, in saying that it's clear that we've altered the chemistry of our atmosphere and that we don't fully understand what the long-term implications of that are. So as a Christian, using a theocentric stewardship ethic towards the environment, I'm very concerned as an individual about the fact that we're altering the chemistry of our atmosphere and don't fully understand the consequences of that. So regardless of the climate uh, um, association with that, mm -hmm. just the fact that we're changing in our world, uh, we're changing our world pretty dramatically and, and, and pretty quickly and it's been accelerating in recent years in a way that we don't understand, causes me to rely on your cautionary principle and say, wait a minute, regardless of the global warming controversy, I, I think we need to be very careful about the fact that we're polluting our atmosphere and we don't know what that means. A am I on the right track here and, and to, um, in characterizing it sort of that way? In a, layperson's uh, Yeah, point. I would think so. It's an issue with most technology is you put it into practice and then 20, 30, 40, 50 years later you start to realize some of the consequences mm -hmm. of it and um, if anything from history of technology should be we need to be watching and sensitive to what exactly are some of these more silent impacts or influences that we're having. Um, lest it be too late or something like that. Yeah. Biola University offers a variety of biblically centered degree programs ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.